application slash force application for non-FAP suppliers, types of federal financial aid funds that are available to the students, uh, scholarships, which again, these are more for Western, but on in general, and then any questions you might have. So like I said, paying for college, it's the responsibility of the student and the family to pay to go to college. If the family has need, so let's say you guys can't afford $22,000 out of pocket, then you guys can complete the FAFSA application or an ORSA application, which the ORSA application is to be eligible for state funds for students that do not file a FAFSA. And the students that do file the FAFSA application, they will be eligible for federal aid through that. And then also the state of Oregon will receive that information and then let us know if they're eligible for state funds. Again, when you do the applications, whether it's FAPSA or ORSA, the family can demonstrate that they have need or needs resources to pay for college, and then the government does the whole big equation to come up with what we call an expected family contribution. That number is an index. It does not mean that you need to pay that to the school or that you have to give that to the student to go to school. It's just an index to let us know what the student's need is. And I'll explain a little bit more on need. But again, principal responsibility is for who? Family. <laughs> Students and family, all right. Okay, so to start off, um, again, students can seek federal and uh, state aid. The FAFSA application is how to start that. That already opened up October 1st, so it's available to everybody. And covered that. So this is shot down here at the bottom is studentaid.gov. That's where their students will go to start the application. Um, here's a couple of things that you might need or will need to complete the FAFSA application. Most of it is so that you can complete what we call the FSA ID. The FSA ID is going to be what the students use to log into the FAFSA application and then sign it at the end. And the parents, they, if they have an SSN, they will be able to create one as well so they can electronically sign at the end. All right. If a parent does not have an SSN, then you can print off a paper signature page, and then you can mail that into FAFSA and put the signature on the FAFSA application. All right, so social security number for the FAFSA filer, student and parents. The financial aid, or sorry, the tax information for 2020. Okay, so they're gonna use two years prior to the year that you're filing for. Reason being is that before this, I think maybe like three years ago, we used to use the information from one year prior, and people that own businesses, um, or just in general, they file their taxes later, and then so the students trying to receive financial aid were having hardships because parents hadn't filed the taxes yet. So the government decided that if we used information from two years prior, those would hopefully already be filed, and then make it a little bit easier for students. The personal email address, oh yes, for students creating the FSA ID, do not use the high school address because I think once you are at a high school, you might lose access to that. And then so it's good to create your own personal as well as the parents. Driver's license if applicable, and then a notebook so you can write down the FSA ID password and username. If you happen to forget it, it's not a big deal. They have the user, like forgot username, you got password and then you can answer questions or you can just reset it through like a text or something like that. Any questions on any of that? Okay, again, this is to sign it and be able to enter for the student. Okay, so again, kind of touching back on the information from 2020, we will use the tax information from two years prior and this is gonna be for students going into the 22-23 year, which will be next fall or summer term for us. If your 21 or 2021 financial information is a better reflection of the family's current situation, the government allows us to use that information, okay? So for instance, the students that we have in school right now, they use the 2019 tax information. And then with COVID happening, a lot of parents lost job or reduced hours so they earned a little bit less. If that's the case for any of you, that in 2021 you earned less than in 2020, you can contact our office or any office that you're gonna attend for their institution and just let them know that your 2021 better reflects your current situation. That way they can go ahead and do what we call a professional judgment. We'll plug in those numbers 
if that makes the expected family contribution, which again we'll touch on in a little bit, if that number goes down, then and it benefits the student, we'll use that information. Okay, and then so yeah, again, the FAFSA that you're putting into, or the information you're putting into the FAFSA will bring out the expected family contribution, and again, it's just an index to determine what the student is eligible for. What the, the biggest factors that they're using to calculate that is gonna be how many are in the household, the number in college, um, how much the whole family as a whole earned in 2020, so if the student worked or not, I have the financial information for 2020. The best way I can explain it to families is that they're, you're giving them a glimpse of one year of their current situation as a whole, and then they look and see how many mouths you have to feed, So because they know that's expensive, right? You guys have to live. And then if you have any in college, they know that's very expensive, so they understand that there's less money to go around because of that as well. And then that kind of determines what the need is for them. Okay, so here's the gist I think that everyone wants to know is how much is it gonna cost for my student to attend, right? Or just the family personally, how much is it gonna cost in total? So when you do the FAFSA application, this is gonna be most of the, well, other than the Oregon Opportunity Grant at the bottom, the top, all the rest of it is gonna be what's available through the FAFSA. So right now for students that are in school this fall that have an expected family contribution of zero, they're eligible for the max of the Pell Grant, which is federal free money. You do not have to pay that back. That, the Pell Grant is 6,495 for the year, okay? And as that expected family contribution number goes up, the Pell Grant goes down, okay? The cutoff for that is right, I think right now it's about 5,755, I wanna say. So you complete the FAFSA application, let's say your expected family contribution is 6,000, you would not qualify for the federal Pell Grant this year, okay? Um, let's say it was 4,000, then you might qualify for like $1,000 or less of that, right? And again, as it goes higher, you get less and less. As it goes lower, you get a little bit more. So at bare minimum, I'm gonna start over here with the loans now because that's the free money, and I don't, you know, a lot of people, have, again, expect that it's going to pay for your school once you complete the FAFSA, but it's different for everyone. So at bare minimum, if you do a FAFSA application, all students are eligible for 5500 in their student loans, okay? Now, again, based on that expected family contribution, they might qualify for more than that. But at Western right now, if you guys were to stay at home living with parents and not live on campus, if you were enrolled in 15 credits per term, it would cost you about $10,500 for the year, okay? You guys being in Silverton, let's say you wanted to attend Western, I think you might be out of like the 30 mile range to petition to not live on campus. So for those students, you, you, your population here, you would probably have to live on campus, let's say, and that's about $22,000 for the year. That's not counting books and supplies, right? So that's just, your registration at Western and the living there and the meal plan. So if you are that family, if you are that student, and at bare minimum you're having 5,500 of your student loans, then we need to figure out how else are we gonna come up with more money, right? So again, once you file the FAFSA application, afterwards FAFSA will give you an estimate of what you're eligible for, and it will tell you how much of the Pell Grant you're eligible for based on that estimate from the expected family contribution and then you're gonna see the loans, the 5,500. The federal work study program right there in the middle, if you see that on any of your award letters, so like let's say you put U of O, OSU, Western, Chemeketa on your FAFSA application, they're all gonna send you what you're eligible for from that school. When you see the federal work study, that's not a fund like a loan or free money like a grant or a scholarship. It's just there to let the students know that if they were to get a job on campus that's part of that program, they could earn up a certain amount for that year. That amount is different from school to school. The school decides you know, what the requirements are to be eligible for it, and also how much they can earn for the year. The way the students benefit with that program is, let's say your student is, comes and applies into our office, 
and they want to work in the financial aid office, the federal government will pay 75% of their wages, and then the other 25 comes out of our pocket as an office, out of our budget, right? So we want to hire those students first before someone that's not eligible for that program. Also, with that program, I mean, obviously the school knows that they're a student first, so they won't allow them to work more than, I think, 20 hours a week, and they're very flexible with the hours that they work. But again, just so if you guys do see that, it's gonna calculate into a total of what the student's receiving for the year, but just know that that's not part that they're gonna give towards their student. Okay, so we touched on the loans, we touched on the Pell Grant, the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant at least at Western, and again, this is one of those funds that's a little bit different from uh, school to school, but for us, all first and second year students, and the way we determine that is every 45 credits that a student earns, they move up a level, all right? So if you're under 45 or under 90, you're considered a first and second year student. If you have a zero expected family contribution, they qualify for an extra $900 at our school. And again, that might change as you go institution to institution. They might get more or might get less. Also, uh, I know the FAPS application just opened up from the first. And if you can do it, most schools have a priority deadline. That fund right there for us is a priority deadline fund. So if you file prior to February 1st, you would still qualify. If you file after February 1st, you would no longer be eligible for that or the federal work study at our school. Any questions on that so far? Okay. All right, so um, for this, let's say your student is only eligible for the bare minimum, 5,500. The government then says that the parents can apply for a parent plus loan, okay? So your, the parents would get their own personal loan, just like the student loans, so you can defer payments until after you, the student graduates or you can start making payments as the student is in school, but it would be the parent's loan, and you have to do a credit application for that loan. So on the two student loans, there's two different types, and some students might have one of just all unsubsidized, and then some students might have uh, both subsidized and unsubsidized. The difference between the two, the subsidized loan does not accrue interest while the, school, or the student is in school. Okay, so if you come in, you receive $3,500 of that subsidized loan, you don't have to make any payments on that loan while you're in school, and it's not gonna accrue any interest, so what you borrow is what you borrow. And after you graduate, or you quit being enrolled for six credits or more, there's a six month grace period, and after that, then you have to start making the plans with the lender on how to repay that back. After that six month grace period, then whatever you borrow, let's say it was 7,000 total or something like that, then it will begin to accrue interest after that six month grace period. The unsubsidized loan, which you can look at as unfavorable to the student, that one accrues interest as they begin to receive a portion of those funds. So most students are gonna get $2,000 of that max for the year, and we divide it into three, so they get a portion each term to their student balance. And then that third is going to begin to accrue its interest. Winter term, we give you another third. That will begin to accrue its own interest. Spring term happens, and then you get another third, and then that will begin to accrue its interest. Loans have different interest rates every year. So let's just say last year was 3.5. You'll have, when you start making those payments back, they will have that 3.5 on that loan. This year, uh, let's say they're at 5.0 they will have their own separate loans. So you'll have separate different loans for each year. You can decide to consolidate those later, but that's for after graduation, and we'll have a different topic for that one later. All right, so again, that stuff that I just touched on, that's what's available when you do the FAFSA application, okay? So at max, 5,500 in your loans, 6,495, so you got about 12,000 right there. And then you have an extra maybe let's round up to a thousand from the uh, supplemental educational opportunity grant. So that puts us at what thirteen thousand. So again, at Western, if it's one of the uh, least costing schools, if it costs you twenty two thousand to attend for the year and live on campus, you still need to come up with some more money. Then again, that's where the parent plus loan can fill in if parents want to help out. 
and then if not, a private student loan would be the next option if you do not receive any scholarships. Outside of that, um, FAFSA filers, your expected family contribution is gonna go to the state, all right? Then this year for the students that we have at school, if your expected family contribution is $6,000 or less, and you file prior to July 1st, was what they moved the deadline to this year, you would qualify for another $3,612. Okay? So now that gets us a little bit closer. So this is again, Oregon Opportunity Grant is for students who graduate from an Oregon high school. 6,000 or less EFC for this year. Uh, I think for the last three years, it's been 4,000 or less. But since there was less students being enrolled, they were able to increase that expected family contribution. Also, this number has gone up a little bit at a time each year. So not expecting it to fall, same thing for the Pell Grant. Um, and again, most of the time, I think the deadline is around April or May. So I would just use the same priority deadline of February 1st to make sure that you're doing your FAFSA. That way you're gonna get both priority deadlines with schools and the state. And then also the state has their own scholarships that you can apply for as well. So just Oregon residents. Yeah. How do you determine if you're going to get subsidized or unsubsidized? Oh, yes. Thank you for asking that question. So she was asking how we determine whether a student gets subsidized or unsubsidized loan. So uh, again, let's use 22000 that it's going to cost to attend at Western. If your expected family contribution is less than 22000 then you're considered to have need. Okay. Subsidized loan is a need-based aid, and then so if you have um, your expected family contribution was twenty-one thousand, we could only add one thousand dollars of that subsidized loan for the student, and the rest of the five thousand five hundred would come from the unsubsidized loan. Does that make sense? So then, for most students, they don't go past that twenty-two thousand mark unless your your family's earning a lot of money. And so they usually have enough need for us to give them the max of that subsidized loan for the year, which is 3,500. And then after that, then we have to fill it in with the unsubsidized loan. As students become, well, like closer to like third and fourth year, or we get transfers in, once you become 24 years of age, they no longer use your parents' information and it's just the student's information alone. Um, usually at that point, so their student loans are getting higher because they go up year to year. For dependent students, it goes up like $1,000 for the first, once you become a sophomore. Um, and then as a junior and senior, they can get $7,500 in total. But independent students who are no longer using their parents' information, they can get up to $12,500. And then, so that's kind of where those um, go up and then that need has a little bit more to play on that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, you're asking my question. Okay, okay. Like you said, any other Okay. All right, so again, first year students have the opportunity to accept up to 5,500 in their student loans. That amount will increase every year, again, based on 45 credits being earned. And then the minimum a student can get just by following the FAFSA was that. Also, the loans are automatically deferrable. So again, they don't have to make any payments while they're in school. It would be until after they either stop being enrolled for half time, which is six credits or more, or if they graduate. So, um, as the students file the FAFSA, it usually takes schools about four to five business days to receive their application, but it also takes the schools a lot longer because we're currently barely starting this year. And then so in order to get all the forms and everything ready to start awarding students for the following year, the upcoming year, it probably will start around December, somewhere around there. You'll start getting early award letters. But we're also gonna be sending emails and FAPS is gonna be sending emails to the students, letting them know if we need any information. So even though the student's still in their senior year or junior year, whichever it might be, um, make sure if you are fully admitted, They'll at least check your email for whatever institution you're at like once a week so you're not missing important information asking for us for documents we might need and so on but also we have to use a lot of federal jargon so 
if you don't understand what we're asking for, feel free to call in and like that we can help you out. Even if you're not attending our institution, all financial aid offices are pretty much working the same. It just might be a little bit of a different form. So we can still help out with that. Okay, so and like I was saying earlier, so this is who specific as far as the scholarships go, but all institutions should pretty much be offering some sort of scholarships and um, options for students like this. Okay, so again, if you don't have enough from the FAFSA, then you need to capitalize on the free money. So institutions are gonna have their own scholarships that you can apply for. So we have a couple different various ones. Uh, the first ones that we're gonna start off talking about right after this slide is gonna be the presidential scholarships. So students coming in for the first year, it's gonna be based on GPA. And so we'll have a couple of those to look at, which again, most institutions will have something like this. The Wu General Scholarships, that's one that's open to everybody. Um, and they're usually around $1,000 per award, but you can do one essay and then you, we try to match you up with um, the profile you create to match you with whatever uh, you're able to get out of those. The Diversity Commitment Scholarship, that one might be more towards just Western, but again, there's gonna be options available at other institutions that might be like it, and the Bilingual Teaching Scholarship. For us, for our institution, right now we have a cap of $6,000 that you can receive from the school for the year. So if you were to do a couple of these and receive maybe 6,000 from one and 2,000 from another, we would still only be able to go up to 6,000 total. So for the presidential scholarships, uh, I'll start here at the bottom. So if you come in out of high school with your 3.6 high school GPA and you submit your FAFSA prior to the February 1st priority deadline, you're gonna qualify for $1,000. Okay, and this is also for students, sorry, and this is also for students that are admitted after March 1st. So we've got to change that a little bit there. So even if you file past the priority deadline, you will still be eligible for $1,000. Now to qualify for the $2,000, you got to have a GPA of 3.6 to 3.94, and then that one you do have to have your FAFSA submitted prior to February 1st and be admitted by January 15th. The other thing I want to touch on too is in order to access the scholarships, at least for us, you would have to be admitted to access your student portal. And from that student portal is where you can access the application for the scholarships. So again, if you're planning on attending multiple institutions, if you don't have an idea yet of where you want to go, talk to the admissions offices and see if you can do the application without having to pay an application fee. Because a lot of schools are going to you know, charge an application fee but you're probably going to be, or need to be admitted to do the applications, okay? And again, if you do get admitted, it does not lock you into attending that institution. Again, it's just hopefully giving you the chance to apply for the free money. And then at the end, when you make your decision, you just got to enroll for whatever school you want to attend. So again, for us, you would want to be admitted before January 15th, do your FAFSA application prior to February 1st, and then you would qualify for $2,000, 3.6 GPA to a 3.94. For the presidential scholarship, um, up at the top for 4,000, if you come in with a 3.95 GPA, and again, file FAFSA prior to February 1st, it'll be admitted by January 15th, you'll qualify for 4,000. On top of that, we didn't put it on here, it's new for this year, but students who qualify for that, um, if you do the general application, then you, and you score high on it, you could possibly receive another $5,000 on top of it. The reason it goes past that $6,000 cap that I was just talking about earlier is the $6,000 cap is for funds that come directly from Western. And then when you're doing the general scholarship, a lot of that's coming from real money that's from our foundation scholarships. So that $5,000 would be separate than just being Western funds. So possibility of $9,000 there. All right, and again, same thing for every institution. You know, they want students with great grades, um, so they're gonna have some sort of funds available to them like this. All of these scholarships are renewable. Okay, so the hard part is receiving it, meeting the qualifications to earn it, then after that's a little bit easier. So for us, 
to renew it for the year, you would have to earn at least 36 credits, which is the minimum to be a full-time student each term, 12 credits per term. And then you have to have a 3.0 GPA at the end of the year. Or at, yeah, at the end of the spring term. Do you guys understand how credits work? So, so the credits is just the, the number of hours that a student is putting into a class. So if you're in a math class, it's like four, you gotta show up four days a week. That's gonna be four hours, so then it's considered four credits. Students are charged on a credit for credit basis, but if you enroll in 12 credits, that's considered full time. And then again, you do that for three terms, you would be meeting 36 if you're in all of those. All right, and then the Wu General Scholarship, again, be admitted um, as soon as possible, really, right? I believe our school right now is waiving the admissions application fee. So like that you can have access to this student portal, which is this picture here. And then you have all these little icons. And there's a scholarship icon second to last on the right. That's where you would be able to just click on there. You create a profile, you do one essay, and then it tries to match up with, I think, over 70 scholarships that we have right now. And again, the most of them are about $1,000. It says that you must have a 3.0 GPA to participate in most of the competitive scholarships. If you come in and you don't have a 3.0 GPA, still apply. The way we grade it, which is probably gonna be similar to all other schools, we're gonna grade them on the essay, and then so they're expecting college level writing, so make sure someone proofreads it, um, and then try to use as many of the words that they allow you to put as possible because we'll have like one sentence <laughs> essays that we receive sometimes, and there's not much to go off of there. So um, for us, I think we have 350 words to use. We try to use the same question that the state is gonna use if you do the state applica or this application for the state um, scholarships. That way you can just say the same one and use it for the state as well. Um, yeah, and again, back to the great part. So we're gonna grade the essay on punctuation, all the grammatical stuff, and then uh, things that you are involved in, so like whether you have a job right now, uh, if you participate in sports, if you're in clubs, if you go ahead and volunteer, put everything all the way back to your freshman year in high school. I think a lot of students think that we're looking for like the most recent things, and then so there's a lot of stuff left off, not much for us to judge on, and then so students lose point in that regard. And then it's gonna be academic achievements, so if you're in honor roll, the dean's list, anything like that, go ahead and put those on, and again, all the way back to freshman year, and let us judge whether things count or not. And then after that, it's gonna be based on the GPA, so 3.0 and above, so I think it's 3.0 to 3.2, students get a point, 3.2 to 3.4, they get two, and it just goes on from there. So if you come in with less than a 3.0 and apply, you're not gonna get points on that, but a lot of students lose a lot of points on the essays and the other portions too. So either way, it might equal out if you, have, if you do grade on all other three parts of that grading system. Any questions on that? So the GPA, so I think it's whenever they get admitted to the institution, that's the one that they're gonna go off of. So I'm assuming it's probably what they have at that time. But then again, once they get to the end of the year, like let's say you were at a 2.9, and at the end of the year you were at a 3.15, I believe admissions will go ahead and change that. But yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions on that? Okay. Okay, and then so for us at Western, we have a diversity commitment scholarship which is $6,000 per year, and it can be renewed up to five years in case you know, you're taking less than 15 credits per term. It'll take you a little bit extra than just four years in general. And again, I apologize if I'm not using the mic very much. Um, so the application deadline is the 1st of March. That will be through our general scholarship um, database there where you go to apply and click on that and do the general. It will have its own separate scholarships that you can also apply for. You click on them, it'll tell you what the requirements are and then what the funds are available for that. So 6,000 per year, renewable, and it's as simple as answering the question of what does diversity mean to you and how have you applied it in your community, okay? 
So if you're helping out, you know, let's say you were in an ASL club or anything like that and you're out promoting the ASL in your community, apply for that, okay? It's pretty wide open. Uh, I think there's, Sigla, you know about how many, like 20? Uh, there's 20 this year, there are to 30. Okay, yeah, so about 20 to 30, so that's definitely, and again, I'm assuming there's gonna be some of this available at all other institutions. The bilingual teaching scholarship for us, uh, again, it's renewable up to five years, $3,000 per year, must be, so the application must be submitted before March 1st, and an admitted student can access a scholarship application again through the student portal, scholarship icon. And if you guys have more questions, uh, you can contact Dr. Maria Dantas Whitney, and there's her email right there. So it's for students that want to teach that are bilingual, okay? And then so if you're going to school to teach Spanish or something like that, and you're, you know, you're, or at least you're taking Spanish classes or something like that, let's just say that's how you're going to be bilingual you might qualify for that as well. If you guys have questions on that, again, I have my business cards, and then I can always put you in contact with them, or if you want to take pictures of that email, go ahead and do so. And if not, I can always come back to this as well. For students that are undocumented, so part of the DACA program, they can go ahead and, so they're not eligible for the federal aid, so they can still apply for the state aid, and if you have any friends that are undocumented part of the DACA program, there's the Dream.us scholarship that they can receive, and it's up to $33,000 for four years, and it's $8,250 per year. It's a lot more difficult for these students to get because of the federal aid, the loans are not there, and the rest of the federal aid, like the free money. But this one's probably the biggest one that we've seen. I think we're one of the, one or two, out of two schools maybe, or maybe just the one that um, is accepting the dream.us right now in Oregon. Um, on top of the 8,250, they will receive a $1,000 stipend to help for books and supplies. Uh, again, the dream.us is where they can go to apply for that scholarship there. They will also be eligible for the institutional scholarships, so from the school and again the state aid. The ORSA application is also available for the students that can't do the um, FAFSA. So that's how the state would get the expected family contribution. All right, the need to knows for the scholarships. So uh, transfer students, which might not apply for you right now, but if you were to go to, like, let's say, Chemeca Community College, you come in as a transfer student. We do have a transfer scholarship for those students. Um, if you have a 3.5 GPA or above, 2,500 for the year, and it's it renewable for up to you. Or for the two years. And then again, the department scholarships, that's for your specific programs that you're gonna be into. So let's say you were a music major, the music department will have their own personal scholarships to give out to those students. So you can also apply for those, and the deadline for that will be May 1st. Then what we are evaluating on there, again, is gonna be the GPA, uh, volunteer community service, extracurriculars, and then again on the essay, punctuation, grammar, and creativity. And so this is an example of what a, a financial aid award letter looks like. So again, once all your FAFSA information comes into the schools, this is a copy of ours here, and this is what you would be seeing on your end. And again, there's a lot of stuff on there, and a very difficult if you've never seen this before. But we're gonna, on the total column all the way on the right, that's gonna be what you're receiving for the year from each fund, okay? Then we split it up into three, so the student gets a third each term that they're enrolled. And then so at the bottom, you'll have what they would get for the, uh, each term, right? That's 6,835, 36, and then 36. Down here, uh, this red box, the total resources, for some reason, we like to call the expected family contribution total resources as well. And then so again, that's why it's a little bit difficult for some parents and families to understand. So that's where, for us, we're showing you what your expected family contribution is. If you look right above it, it's split into a parental contribution, which is, again, why a lot of parents think that they have to pay to the school. 
but it's just out of the tax information that you submitted, they, if like let's say theirs was that $200, they're saying with what you reported, they would think that you as a family, or at least on the parent side, you could help the student with $200, is all that's saying. Same thing on the student section, right underneath that. But again, for this student, their expected family contribution would be zero, which again, lets them qualify for the max of the federal Pell Grant, 6,495 at the very top. All right? And then since again, it's, it is zero, they have the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant for 900, which is the second one down. We're assuming this student applied prior to the priority deadline for the state, so they have the Oregon Opportunity Grant of 3612, which again is free money. Those three are free money. Um, from Western, right now, I think that tuition remission is now gone. They're constantly adding and taking away funds, but this current year we're in, we have a new tuition remission. Filing your FAFSA prior to February 1st, and if you're Pell Grant eligible, you automatically get that. I don't know if we're gonna replace that with something else. Chances are probably likely. They'll just change the name on it. And then from there, then it's your federal work study, which again, even though it's showing $3,000 on there, the student isn't gonna receive that to their student account, but we are accounting it in that total for the term. So you see how they're at 6,835 for fall? They're really at 5,835 if they were to accept both of their loans, okay? So once we start giving the funds to the student account that fall, fall term, they're gonna get 5,835 instead of that 6,835. Because that federal work study, again, is just a place to let you know what you can earn for that term. And then you got your two student loans after that. So again, this is like you were explaining with that question, so, or I was explaining when you asked that question. This student's expected family contribution is zero. To attempt for the year, it says it's going to cost twenty-four thousand seven thirty-two. Since the EFC is less than that, twenty-four thousand seven thirty-two, the family is considered to have need. The student's considered to have need, so they get the max of the subsidized loan, which is three thousand five hundred for the year. If that total resources expect the family contribution, if that was to say twenty-five thousand, then it's higher than what it, we assume it's going to cost for the year. So then they would have no need, so then they would have 5,500 total of the unsubsidized loan. Okay, does that make sense? All right. And then down here at the very bottom, the last box. So after the student's total awards for the year, 20,507, we deduct that from what we, we have, we call it the estimated cost of attendance, or the total budget. Uh, we deduct that from the $24,732. That leaves $4,225 available in room for students to receive more aid, whether it be loans or scholarships. So the parent could apply for a Parent PLUS loan for that or anything in between. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, well yeah, that's kind of the gist on there, but if you have any questions on the amounts or funds, I can always go back to those slides. You guys ready for it? <laughs> so yeah, FAPS is open by raise of hands for students. Have you guys already filed? Okay. Well, we have till February 1st, but hopefully it's gonna happen next week. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, so hopefully you guys got some good information. I know it's a lot, and so what I would encourage you to do is go home and create your FSA ID. Maybe you do that tonight, and then tomorrow start working on the FAFSA. Um, if you start getting through it and you get stuck, next Monday night at 6.30, we will be here, um, well, not in this room, but in a computer lab, and uh, I think Antonio or his colleague will be here to help answer any questions. Uh, myself and a couple of other counselors will be here to help you work through the application. And so we're happy to help you with that. Um, I think most of you grabbed one of these. This has some really great information. A lot of it that he went over, but you have your own copy of um, like a sample financial aid letter and just some more logistics about the FAFSA. So be sure to take that home and look through it. 
And then this is um, just, I want parents to know and students that later this month in October on the 25th, we will be working with students going through um, kind of a workshop style during the school day where we will help them uh, go more in depth on learning about scholarship applications, filling out college applications, um, just getting some of those logistical things, giving them time to work on them and talking to them about um, writing essays. And so they'll get some time in school and then during AG they'll also be working on those things. And then I'm always happy to help students individually or um, during AG time in the computer lab. So those are some things that are coming that I wanted you to know about. And then lastly, in December, we will have um, our local scholarship night. And that is where uh, our local scholarship donors will come and talk about their scholarships that students are eligible to apply for. So right now, there's not much open other than I know the Elks Most Valuable Student Application is open and on the Silverton High School website. And so you can look on there under uh, students and then scholarship opportunities and just check out the page. And as the year goes on, students will be able to get a lot more um, information as to when the local scholarships are opening up. But So I'll be announcing uh, the date of this local scholarship day. It'll be in December, though. Uh, I'll stick around for a little bit um, if anyone has individual questions and then just remember I'll send out information but next Monday if you want some individual help we will be here in the fishbowl computer lab to help too. Thanks for coming.